All right, thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Ryu Ishimoto. I work for a company called Mitokura, uh, and we're a subsidiary of uh, Sony uh, Semiconductor Solutions. And uh, today I'm gonna talk about modernizing the development of vision sensing applications on IoT devices with WebAssembly. A lot of history about us. Uh, we were founded in 2010. I think I was like the fifth one that joined, you know, good old days. Um, we developed MiddleNet, which is an open source uh, software defined network solution. So we provide a network virtualization for uh, various cloud platforms, including OpenStack. Um, and in 2016, uh, we, had a, we made a little pivot, a small one. Uh, we started to we wanted to apply SDN for a security purpose in the industrial IoT. So that's kind of where we got our first taste of IoT there. And uh, in 2019, uh, we were acquired by Sony Semiconductor Solutions, where they were planning to build a service uh, for, us, for the smart cameras. And our, so our responsibility was to sort of provide virtualization technologies for that platform. And I'm happy to announce that this year, 2023, we've uh, released Atrius, uh, which is the, uh, the Edge AI platform. Uh, the details of that, uh, I'm gonna explain a little bit later, but you can also come to our booth with the HUS folks there. But today I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the, uh, the web assembly part and how that's used in Atrius. Okay, so brief explanation of Atrius and the uh, Atrius Vision, Vision App SDK where the web assembly is used. Okay, so Vision AI, uh, this is it's a very challenging field and uh, here are some of, the, some of the reasons why they're challenging and and how Atrius tries to uh, fix those. Uh, one, uh, we've found out that the most developers, uh, where you sort of apply, you know, the, you develop, when you de develop AI applications in these IoT settings, well, they're not very comfortable with their knowledge of AI. Okay, so uh, this is one problem. So we have, to f we have to make that easy for them, so we provide uh, um, AI models that are pre-trained, so it's easier to develop against it. Uh, the models themselves, they have to be tiny because we want them to run on these IoT devices that are resource constrained. But if you shrink the, the, the models, then you lose accuracy. So there's that, um, there's that game of finding the right balance, right? And that's hard. So H provides the full tools and, and services to sort of optimize that, okay? Uh, tuning, yeah, so these cameras, you, when you deploy these cameras everywhere, every environment is different, right? You have uh, things change, every hardware is different, the lighting condition is different. So you have to be able to detect potential drifts of the models. Uh, you have to be able to retrain and you have to be able to redeploy. Okay, so Atrius has that feature as well. So a lot of things uh, we have to, uh, a lot of challenges we face and Atrius is, uh, is, going, is trying to uh, um, solve those. Okay, so the most, one of the most important components of Atrius of course is Sony's image sensors. Uh, one that's one that's here is IMX 500, which is an uh, image sensor. And that's so special about this one is that it has an AI chip embedded. So when an image comes in, uh, the inference can be done on the chip itself, and and, uh, and the metadata comes out. So you don't have to really send uh, you know stream videos to the cloud for uh, for for the applying AI. So when you have that, uh, these AI models are optimized for IMX 500. So you have a very fast and optimized uh, processing, and you have uh, low latency, um, low power, because you don't have to wake up the CPU to do anything. And uh, of course, you know, you're, you're applying mo uh, AI at the closest place where the, where the data is generated, so it uh, preserves privacy. So Atrius is actually not just a device, though. It's actually the entire end-to-end -end cloud to device solution. So at the top, you have, uh, actually, here you have uh, cloud services that where you connect, you take IMX 500 devices and you connect to the cloud, where you can do the device management, uh, application management, and you can do like the, uh, the, the ML model management, okay? So you have like a basic IoT kind of service as well. So that's what, so Atrius includes all of that. And today I'm gonna talk about the one, uh, the, the red box over there, uh, development environment. So platform doesn't really mean anything unless you have build something that does that something, something interesting, something useful. For that to happen, you need to have developers, right? You need to have applications, you need to have models. So uh, today I'm gonna focus on the SDKs that we provide so that it makes it easier for developers to 
come up with something interesting, you know, to customize their solutions using Atrius APIs uh, for their needs. So as I mentioned, there's a cloud API, which I'm not gonna go into today, but you know, here you can provide you know, your own cloud, cloud application using the SDK. The device SDK, so it has a lot of components. I'm gonna skip the AI parts, but here, uh, the edge application development, this is where WebAssembly is used. Okay, so that's Atrius, so now I'm gonna talk about the WASM, okay? Um, so WASM in IoT. I think most of you guys know about WebAssembly nowadays, like it's, it's, it's a big trend now, right? But I think most, uh, mostly, most likely you guys have heard about I, uh, Web, WebAssembly in either cloud service or, or maybe the browser settings. It's rare to use this on IoT. I think it might be one of the first ones. And, but there are a lot of challenges and here I'm talking about the immediate I IoT challenges. I mean, there are many of them, but there's one that I just mentioned here. So IoT solutions will continue to evolve because devices will get better. You can do more things on it, and there'll be more demands to do more things on it, right? So you have to be able to customize. You have to be able to update functions, functionalities, uh, easily, uh, you know, safe and fast and, and frequently as well. And you can't do that right now. And here's some of the reasons why. First, embedded development is just hard, right, uh, compared to, you know, application development. Right now, only low-level languages are supported, C, C++, too many, not too many reusable libraries to, to think of. Um, and sometimes you have to sort of tailor to the device that you're running your application on. So it, that means it's not very portable, right? And also, let's say if you could run um, applications um, in some kind, of, some kind of isolated way. Well, uh, in some abstracted way, you cannot, still, the, these devices don't have memory protection uh, units, so you can't isolate applications from each other, right? So if you run multiple applications, you're basically having them share the same physical memory, and they're gonna step on each other. It's not very safe. So let's say if you do, even if you do manage to run multiple applications, uh, any change right now in, in IoT device you pretty much requires full OTA update, which is, not very desirable, right? You wanna be able to replace certain functionality that, you, that requires updates uh, and without impacting others, right? So for that, I think most people use in cloud, cloud world, you have Kubernetes and things like that. Some, some orchestration system, which doesn't exist for IoT. So uh, not, at the, not at the level of these, these IoT devices, like MCUs, okay? So we need that. And containers are way too big to run on these, on these devices. And also, by the way, when I say edge, I'm talking about the edge devices as in like, far edge MCU class devices, okay? Not, not like the uh, Jetsons and, and things like that. Although they are a very important part of the edge computing use cases, so I'm not excluding them, but here I'm talking about those MCUs. So virtualization is required for isolation. So what do we do? Well, here's a, here's a quick history of that. Physical, okay, okay, I think we all know that. Great uh, isolation, but not very green. Uh, software virtualization came about. Uh, VMware, Zen, uh, I think these were, um, do for virtualization and isolation, but, but they're very slow, right? So that uh, performance was addressed with the hardware virtualization, and so that was good. But still, you're sort of um, virtualizing the entire, com entire computer, and that's kind of too much for a lot of developers. So as you guys know, they're containers, right? Containers are uh, a great tool for um, developers to quickly build something and, and run it. But containers, as I mentioned before, they are too big for, I for uh, IoT use cases and uh, they also require MME for isolation. So I think about 2016 is when I heard for, I, we, for, we heard about WebAssembly for the first time. Um, why Web, WebAssembly is, is good for, for this particular use case is that, well, it's, it's, a, it's a safe language runtime. I'm gonna go a little bit more about what Web, WebAssembly is next, but this doesn't require MMU, and uh, it, it's, therefore it is very suitable for MCUs. Okay, so WASM, uh, I think some of you guys already know about this, but it's a binary instruction format and uh, it's, it's uh, designed as a portable compilation target for various programming languages. So why this is good for uh, IoT? Well, it's, first of all, it's easy to call routines from WebAssembly web from various languages. Okay, the, one, of the, one of the goals of uh, what I do and what we wanna do with Atrius is to build an ecosystem and ecosystem includes developers. We have to make developers easy to develop these edge AI applications on these embedded devices. 
So it has to make it easy for them. Different languages are very important. Small footprint, this is critical because we're talking about IoT devices. Uh, multiple language support, I'm gonna go, go over that a little bit more. Memory safety, I mentioned that already. So language support, okay, C, C++, of course. A lot of people are familiar with those in, in the embedded world, so that's, that's fine. But we wanna, we wanna be more inclusive and we wanna, we wanna add more developers that are used to doing different languages, right? higher level languages. One, what Rust is getting very popular these days. TypeScript and Python Go, I think that we don't have like a full support for these, but Python in particular is a, a very important language for us. Uh, and I'm gonna go over that a little bit later, but that, that mainly it's because developers that wanna run stuff on these devices tend to be like AI developers and they love Python, you know, and there are a lot of useful libraries for them as well. Um, okay, it's backed by a strong organization, webassembly.org. They're, uh, they're sort of in charge of standardiz standardization uh, activities and uh, by Code Alliance, which who's uh, actually implementing these standards. And we're actually part of the Bicode Alliance. Okay, so WebAssembly looks good. So now the next is to choosing the runtime. Okay, so we looked at a few. This, this might be a little up, uh, outdated. Uh, I think there's also a Wasm Edge, which I wanted to include, but this, this is like an old slide. But this is, this is how we decided. Um, this, we did some uh, uh, comparisons here. Um, these are all good options. We ultimately chose WebAssembly micro runtime for several reasons. Um, it's good support of, of different architectures, but also the second point, interpreter, JIT, and AOT. So AOT ahead of time compile is very important for us for performance reasons. So in IOTs, IOT uh, um, applications, it's just way too slow to go through interpreter. Okay, so it has to be uh, compiled into the, uh, the, the binary format for the architecture. It's much faster. So, it, it, so with AOT, it provides you like a near native speed. Okay, not quite there though. Um, Oh, the operating system is also important. Uh, Linux support, of course, but for, for MCUs, we, we have to have support for uh, RTOS, and uh, we chose not X because, well, it, it's a little biased decision, but Sony has a, a major contributors in not X, so familiarity is a big thing, you know, so we, we chose, uh, so all things combined, you know, Lammer was the, was the best choice for us. Okay, so now we have the runtime. So, here, the H is, so not, not, we're just not just running applications on devices, we're actually running applications for vision applications, right? Vision, uh, vision AI, to be specific. So, so there's more to it. So now we have to make it, a, uh, we have to provide an SDK to make it easier to, to create these uh, vision, uh, vision applications. So, um, okay, this is, I don't know what this is. Uh, oh. Okay, um, uh, we're, I was actually at the WasmCon a couple months ago and we did a three hour workshop and uh, I wanted to show what we did there. I think that gives you a good idea of what our uh, tools and SDK look like. So I use this slide, okay? So um, let's, let's see. Devices, uh, I mentioned MCUs as the devices that we support already. So that, that's what we target. Uh, we use, uh, also we have uh, Raspberry Pi, Jetson, we support those as well. In fact, Raspberry Pi has been a very good uh, device for us for development and demos. Uh, it's, it's a very accessible uh, device, you know. Uh, also, the interesting one, the crossover MCUs, because these are good for us because they're actually um, more powerful than, the, than the, uh, most of the MCUs out there, so you can do more, but they're small enough that they're still cheap and, you know, cheap and, and good for IoT cases. Okay, so on these devices, we have an agent running, okay? An agent, you can think of it like a, a kubelet on Kubernetes. Okay, it's responsible for uh, lifecycle management of the applications that run on, on that device. Uh, it leverages WebAssembly micro runtime for the isolation of the applications. And uh, it also uh, does integration with IoT platforms because the, ultimately the data that comes out of that device has to go somewhere in the cloud so people, people can use it and view it and do further analysis. Okay, and the integration with the cloud, uh, I mentioned the things board there, it's an open source IoT uh, platform, I don't know if you guys heard of it, but we just use that for, for the demo purpose. But it could be anything, it could be anything that supports MQTT as a communication channel, and the agent, prov and agent provides that communication. Okay, so that's running on a device. So how about the application uh, development itself? Okay, so first we provide you SDK. Um, so what, what does it include? Okay, so what are the kind of functions you need for 
edge AI application, vision sensing applications, well, you need a sensor API, right? You have to get images and you have to configure the sensors, so you need to have that. Uh, you typically would run uh, you know, AI-related functions there, uh, executing inference, for example, uh, loading a model. So we need to have API for that. Uh, and uh, in some cases, we may actually have an application communicating with another, another application. So that communication channel uh, has to be provided through the API as well. So, so the users, uh, developers don't have to think about these things. They just have to call API, hopefully abstracted in the right level, so it'd be easy to do that. And so that's the SDK. Uh, so we've also provided CLI. So you could do development by connecting a uh, device to the cloud and go through the iteration of development, you know, cloud device, cloud device. But this is very inefficient. You know, that, that's, that's, one of, that's one of the feedbacks we got. That's how it was before. So we, a lot of people wanted to do uh, local development, so we have a CLI that basically provides all the functionalities you need for communication between, uh, that would happen between the cloud and the device and also the uh, device to the cloud for, for data. Most of the data from cloud to the, to the device is like a, it's like a control path. And, and the other way is the, uh, the data path, right? So through the MQTT broker, you can get you know, all the communications done. The MQTT used for the CLI is just anything. It could be, uh, we use, I think, Mosquito. Okay. Okay, so here's the uh, device stack. Actually, the HS device stack is much more complex than this, but I'm gonna, we made it much more, uh, it's a simplified version. I think it's easier to understand it. Okay, at the top you have uh, modules. These are the applications, right? So you can have multiple of them running. Uh, they run on top of the, uh, the runtime, which is Lammer. And this is the agent that I was, uh, I was just talking about that does the orchestration of these. And WASI, this is an important component, it's a WebAssembly uh, standard interface. They provide interfaces like the sensor API, like the uh, what is it, the, uh, the neural network API and things like that. Some API is standardized, some API is extensions, but it is through the WASI that the ap applications can, can actually invoke those functions. And the, what carries out these functions are these native libraries and, and, and device drivers. For the, for the uh, demo uh, that we had in, in the WASMCon, we have, uh, for, the sens for the sensor functions, we use SenseCore, which I'm sure you guys haven't heard of, but that's the, uh, we, we actually developed that. This is a sens sensor uh, library that we developed ourselves. But since we, you know, since it's Raspberry Pi, we could have just used like a lib camera, for example. That's, that's fine as well. We just use SenseCore because it's uh, just because whoever the person who actually did this was familiar with it. It has some extra functions that we needed. Uh, OpenCV, we use that. Uh, so these are on the, on the native side, right? So OpenCV, we had to do a lot of uh, manipulation of the image, resize, crop, and things like that. So that was, uh, so we used that, uh, and that was the NN for, for inference. And these libraries are loaded at, at, the, at the start of the agent. Okay, so here's the, just a summary. So this was the setup. Uh, actually, it was much more complex than that, but we, we couldn't do that setup here. I wanted to do a live demo here today, actually, but uh, that, that requires some kind of approval process from Sony, and I, I couldn't get that on time, unfortunately. But we do have a live demo at, at our booth, if, you, if you're curious about it. Uh, they said you can't detect faces, which is what we did in WasmCon, but, but we do have toy cars, you know, object detection. So that's more interesting. But, but I did find a little video that can show you how, how to do some sort of a development using CLI for telemetry application. Not as exciting, all it does is, uh, it sort of emulates a typical IoT case where you just, the application will do the, um, will generate metadata and then you send it to the, to the cloud, okay? Uh, so, yeah, so as I said, CLI is gonna be the one that's doing the orchestration, sending orchestration commands and receiving data. And uh, it, it will also build in the, the compiler so that the application that you code is compiled to the right, uh, right format. Okay, and so yeah, let me show the uh, video. In the beginning, it's a, it's a bit of a promotional stuff, so I, sk I skipped all that. And I, I hope you guys can see it. If not, I will try my best to explain what's going on. So this is kind of like uh, giving you guys an idea of what it would look like if you were to do development of vision sensing applications using our uh, SDN and uh, SDK and, uh, and the CLI. Okay. Okay, and, and what we do here is we're gonna, we're gonna start the project, we're gonna, we're gonna build the project, and we're gonna, compi we're gonna uh, compile it, we're gonna, we're gonna deploy it. And then we're gonna see the data. Now any good CLI should have a help command here. Okay, and we're gonna, first we're gonna, start the, we're gonna start the agent. 
Okay, so here. So the agent has connected through the MQTT broker, and from this, uh, uh, this is VS code, by the way, we can see the, uh, the log here coming out. This is, this is the agent connecting through MQTT to, to the, uh, the container that's running on, on the uh, PC. Always the help command first. Okay, deployment status. All right, so right now we haven't deployed anything. So periodically the agent is reporting what's deployed, okay? And right now, you, I don't know if you guys see it, but you see instances with the, with the empty brackets here. So nothing is deployed, it's empty. Okay, so now it's time to build. The application we use here is source sync. It's actually two applications, the two separate Wasm modules. Uh, source just generates hard-coded text data and sync just sends it. Okay, so it's, it's, it's as simple as you get. It's like hello world, okay, but you, you get the idea. Okay, here's, we just built it so that you see now that there is, should be a Wasm, yeah, there you go. Uh, uh, yeah, so there's a, it's kind of grayed out, but sync and, and uh, source wasm generated. And now we have to deploy these on the device. There you go. Now get the status. All right. Uh, now you see, before the empty brackets, now you see, uh, I think it should be two modules running. Okay, there's sync here and there's source there. Two modules running on the device. And they're connected, by the way. So the sync gets a, uh, generates the data and gives it to source, and source sends it out, to, to, uh, out of the device. Okay, and the last step here is we wanna do make a little change to the code and redeploy and then see what happens. This is gonna give you an idea of what I guess developer, developers go through. Let's skip this part here. Oh yeah, first you have to make sure that the application is running fine. And here, we, there is a, t okay, let me stop the wrong place here, telemetry. Okay, here. Uh, there's a command called telemetry where it lets the user see the output of the application Telemetry, uh, telemetry data. So you can see here, uh, my key, my value is being sent from uh, source sync. Uh, it's exciting. Now, so now we're gonna change the code so that uh, we send something else. Hello world, why not? Well, this works because of the video, but this really works. Okay. <laughs> you rebuild it, and you deploy it, and then you see it. Oh, we're gonna empty it out first, make sure that the, uh, this is optional, though you don't have to do it, but it's, it's actually easier to see it if you do it. Empty means we're just gonna stop everything that's running and then de redeploy. So this is, this is the, as simple as an application gets, but I guess it does have two applications running that communicate with each other, so this is, that's kind of interesting to show. Um, but, oops, sorry, you get the idea. Okay, so that was, that's uh, what we have. Uh, obviously, we can have much more interesting applications running. Object detection is another thing that we show live. So again, if you're interested, please, uh, we only have like an hour after this, I guess, but uh, come by. Okay, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that's kind of what we have right now. So here I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what we plan to make from now. And I think these are not just conceptual, though we have some implementations done, okay? And, and I'm gonna show that. So one, uh, this idea of sensing pipeline. So if you think about the object detection application, that can be broken up into these 
like these components. Think of each one as a, a as an individual separate uh, WebAssembly module. Okay, so first you have a, a source module that takes you know it takes in the frame as an input. Uh, you, know, you resize it by 300 by 300, which is the input for the for the uh, for the model. Okay, then the next one takes that as an input and invokes WASI and then to do the uh, to the inference and you get the output tensor. Now you, uh, you send the output tensor to the next one, which has the object detection. It actually does the uh, extract the bounding boxes of the detect detected object. And then you send that out to the next module that does the actual drawing of the, bo of the boxes. So it's, it's overlaying the bounding box on top of the original image, okay? And then you send that out to the, to the last one, we call it sync. This is, uh, you know, you could send it anywhere, I guess. You could send it to the cloud, but here, because these are images that we're generating here, we wanted to send it to a sense core, which ha happens to have the sort of RTSP uh, server capabilities. So you can stream it, and now you can, once, once, the, once the, uh, the images come here, now you can go to, your, go to your browser and actually see the images with the bounding boxes. Okay, we actually showed this at, at the workshop, which we can do it today. Well, you, you actually see it upstairs though. Anyway, so what, what's so cool about this? Well, sensing pipeline um, is basically you, you're, you're constructing a complex application by uh, putting together a bunch of simple ones, right? Where the simple one, the, this individual small task could be developed by anyone, any team, different teams, okay? What, What's so good about that is that now you can make it, you can make the application uh, composable and reusable. Okay? So all this time I've been talking about SDK that was targeting developers to implement some of these some, some of these modules. What if you don't, you can also target developers that don't have any domain expertise in, you know, computer vision, AI, or, or, or embedded system development, right? All they have to do, actually, if you can reuse these, these uh, um, existing components, you just have to create a pipeline, connect together, and, and uh, deploy it, okay? So the idea means that developers don't really have to worry about, um, another important thing is developers don't have to really worry about how th their application will look like when they're actually deployed. Meaning they don't have to worry about, they shouldn't have to worry about which devices th these applications run, you know, how these, these devices should be connected, because because every edge environment is very different. You know, you have different, different uh, 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 devices, maybe multiple devices, multiple uh, compute devices there, and uh, and they and they change. You know, they upgrade, they they change the infrastructure. So, the idea being, you want to decouple the the implementation of the applications from the actual manifestation of, of those applications uh, at the uh, you know at the edge site. Okay, and it, it and it is the responsibility of the platform to know the capabilities of these devices and how they're connected to sort of smartly place them in the right places, okay? And what's good about the WebAssembly, another good thing about it is, is portability, right? So if you could actually, so there you have three uh, WASM modules linked together and the platform is gonna, knowing what devices to deploy, they're gonna compile them into, into the proper format of AOT and then it's gonna, it's gonna deploy this way because it might have determined that this device right here is not, uh, you know, capable enough to run all three. So you have you, you made a decision to deploy the first two and put the third one over here. Right? Well, this could be like a, like a network edge compute resource, you know, MEC, something like that. So once you get to this point, developers, they can just use something like you know, low code, no code, uh, tools to just uh, construct things together and just deploy. Okay. So this is kind of our vision, our goal eventually. Okay, I mentioned uh, Python, how, why it's so important for us. Okay, this is a lot of data we got from, from Stack Overflow. Uh, Python is very popular, you know, and, and in general. So we wanna, we wanna, we wanna attract more developers, and I, I, like I said before, there are a lot of AI developers who favor Python, right? So uh, we wanna be, we wanna, if, we, if we wanna include them, Python has to be supported. Frameworks. Interesting too, like you have uh, two out of three top three frameworks, uh, you know, uh, one NumPy, you know, found this. These, these are Python specific libraries typically used by, you know, a, uh, AI engineers, right? So you can tell, this, this is a very telling uh, numbers of, of what develop, how developers are using frameworks right now. So Python support. So we've been looking at this. Well, you could try to compile Python to Wasm, right? I mean, you, you know, after all you can, you know, it, there's some support there, but the support is very little. It's not good. So we quickly moved away from that. Uh, some people are still working on it, but we, this is, we, we don't want to wait for that. Another thing you can do is you can take the C Python, you know, which is an uh, reference implementation of Python, 
uh, which is in C, and if you compile that into Wasm, and then you can run uh, on top of uh, application on top of that. So this is this, this works. This we did this, and everything ran except the size of the uh, the AOT was 20 megabytes, way too big for IoT. Another way is to just transpile the Python code into C++, C, and then then you convert that to Wasm. But uh, you know it, this only supports standard libraries, and and this not this doesn't have enough support of useful libraries that we want because, um, like I said, things like NumPy. So, okay. So we took the middle approach and, and then we did a little bit more. So, so here, here's what we did. So first of all, user code, you can transpile into uh, C code using Cython, okay? Now, you could just run that with uh, cpython.wasm. You could do that. Just, just make cpython into, uh, what, compile that into wasm and then just run it, that works. But we also need these libraries, right? These, these are the reasons why we want Python support to begin with, NumPy and things like that. So we had to go to there, uh, to these repositories, you know, generate objects, and then actually statically, comp statically link uh, everything here as a single Wasm module. That's what we did, okay? Now, um, and this works. But that means every Wasm instance is gonna have the entire thing uh, linked together as a whole, so, so we're gonna optimize that a bit, okay? But at the very least, we have these libraries available to Python code and, and, and uh, can be converted into, compiled into Wasm and, and you can run it. So this is a tool that we have, WebPy to Wasm. Okay, and these are the libraries that we currently support. But like I said, it's too big for IoT, so it's, you know, it's more like R&D thing. However, we did start looking into MicroPython, which is a, a, it's the a subset of Python standard libraries that is uh, that's targeting microcontrollers, perfect. So, uh, look how small that is, very small. So, and it also includes a library that is NumPy-like, so you may not even have to get the, the, the NumPy, NumPy library statically linked if you use this. And we actually tried uh, the same exact thing we did with the C Python with this one, and, I, it, and it turned out that the AOT was only 1.5 megabytes, and this is very encouraging. So, and, and we haven't really done gone through the optimization, so maybe, maybe it's in, uh, we can do better than that, okay. Better hurry up. So, putting, so this is the final. This is the kind of final vision. Putting together, putting everything together. We have a sensing pipeline, and we did this at the at the demo. What's good good thing about sensing pipeline, as I mentioned, is that each one of these components may not be developed by the same person, right? Same team. Here, we actually changed this into Python code. We just chose this one because it was the easiest one to to do. We didn't have that much time, but so we have a mix of C plus plus and Python code, and they're linked together potentially provided by, provided by different teams, different engineers. And again, since in pipeline, the platform is gonna do the compilation to the proper format, and that's the optimal deployment onto the devices. Okay, and this, this is a mix of languages, which is one of the, one of the, uh, the major benefits of, of WebAssembly. So now we can have a C++ developers and Python developers providing what they, you know, uh, what they wanna uh, share, and then we can just put them together and, and run them on various environments. Okay, I went through really fast, okay. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna continue to uh, uh, revolutionize embedded systems development. I think WebAssembly is the, is the right tool for that. And uh, we are in Bicode Alliance and we're gonna continue to, we're doing things like we wanna propose some uh, you know, standard uh, interfaces for sensors. That's one thing we wanna do. Um, and we are, contrib we are contributors to, uh, to WAMR as well. Um, Let's see, so yeah, one of the things we wanna do and the reasons why we, so Azure's Vision SDK is mostly open source, some of them aren't, so we wanna continue to open source our, um, at least the device side, so that it's accessible and people can take it, start developing against you know, their own devices and connect to uh, you know, any service they want, but eventually, right now, you, you probably wanna, uh, if you wanna use Atrius, you do need the Atrius devices connected to the HTTP service. But the data you get, the, the data your application generally could be sent anywhere else. You know, it could be, it could be to your application. But you do have to uh, sort of, um, you know, enroll, you know, provision your devices with HTTPS. Okay, so I mentioned what's the extensions. That's what we're doing right now. Uh, and I think I made it in time. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, we have like two minutes, I think, right? Or a few more minutes. If you have questions. Um, Any questions? Also, I'm going to be at the booth for another hour, so if you guys have questions, just come by and 
we can talk. All right, thank you. Thank you.